and welcome to Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres, episode 162. So today we're going to be giving some feedback. About four different people sent some images in, so we're going to be looking at them. So if you're looking to improve your photography, improve your understanding of photography, then you're definitely in the right place. Make sure you subscribe, make sure you click like somewhere down here as well. It was, the algorithms always seem to like the like button being hit with these things. Um, and make sure you tell your friends about this as well. So yes, here we are live on YouTube, unless you happen to be watching the recordings. Um, so uh, yeah, if you are, do happen to be watching live, then leave a comment, say hi, tell me where you're from, tell me what the weather's doing. I see we've got a few people in already. Uh, Robert says, uh, howdy all from a sunny Texas. Pat says, hi all from an uncertain sunshine and still a bit nippy down in, in Somerset. April says, hello everyone from a beautiful sunny day from Long Island, New York. Meg says, hello everyone. Maggie says, rainy again here in southwest Scotland, normal summer really. It kind of is really. There's a <laughs> there's an old joke that's circulated for oh, decades about Scotland. Um, you know, where in the Bible it talks about raining for 40 days and 40 nights. That's just a typical Scottish summer is the response to it. Um, what else have we got? Susan says, hi everyone from a cool, wet and very unsunny Kukubri. Sandra says, hi everyone from a sunny Birmingham. And Janet joins us, says hi from a, uh, from Mississauga. And John says, good day from my Ohio in a on a beautiful day. So it's one of those odd things. Like, so occasionally we have this point whereby pretty much everybody around the world watching this seems to be having the same weather. And then on days like today, everybody around the world seems to be having slightly different weather. So, <laughs> all a bit random. Um, right, where are we? Okay, so today then, today is a feedback week. We've been doing a whole bunch of stuff on cinematic for the last several weeks. And in fact, one of the pictures that's been sent in, we're going to be just going to slightly cinematic theme on that, but I'll come to that. But for the next, uh, for today and for possibly the next week or two at least, we're going to be back to a more regular feedback session. This means this is your opportunity to send in your photos for personalised feedback on your images. Now, to be honest, there's very few places on the internet which actually give you that, and not in a way that's properly constructive. Many years ago, I used to belong to a uh, particular website, um, very high standard of images that were published and they had a critique section. But to be honest, the critique section was brutal. There were people in there who used to really enjoy doing you down for any mistakes that you might have made for your, with your photography. And far from encouraging you, it very often just used to put you off just picking up your camera at all. So you, so you run the risk when you, when you put your pictures in for critique that somebody could be quite nasty about it. So I've always tried to make sure that the, posit the feedback here is very constructive. Alternatively, what happens is you put your pictures up on social media, on Facebook or Instagram, and all your friends like it, but your friends aren't necessarily photographers. So they're saying they're giving it a like because they like you, not necessarily because they know anything about the photo. Um, so this is always a tricky thing to find a decent bit of feedback. So that's what this part of the internet is about. So make the most of it. There are very few places around where you can do this. So send me your images. Let me know what it is you're uh, wanting feedback on and I'll do my best to help. So you can either send your images to the as an Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers Facebook group, which is quite a good place for putting it in. Or you can email me kim at kimayers.co.uk. Um, and uh, yeah, either way, just let me know what kind of feedback you're after. Right, okay, let's make a start. Oh, before I start, I think I saw on Facebook earlier today that Anne from Texas uh, has managed to break her leg. So uh, sympathy is there, wishing you a very speedy recovery. And um, yeah, uh, all the best for that. Uh, not a particularly pleasant thing to have to go through. And from what I can make out, is that something like the second second break in a year or something? So particularly unlucky. So our thoughts are with you today, Anne. Um, right, OK, let's move on then. So what we're going to be talking about today is, uh, like I say, we've got some various bits of feedback uh, to give. And what I'm going to start with, where should we start? Um, let's start with Janet. So Janet sent in, where are we? Let's, no, um, yes, yeah, that's right, this one. Uh, Janet sent in this photo and she said, the main challenge for me 
was a bright green leaf up in, in the upper right corner, which became a distraction. Turning the image black and white seemed to help minimise the distraction. I tried to crop it out, but was losing too much of the water on the right side. Since I was on a boardwalk, I wasn't able to adjust my position much as, as much as I would have liked. So what we can see here then is we've got Janet's picture uh, at a waterfall, black and white. So she sent me um, she sent me the original, and if I double click on that then uh, we can see here that this is... So this is the, the kind of bright green leaf she was talking about, feeling like it was distracting from the image. Um, she said when she tried to crop it out, you, and you can see that, if you try to crop that out, then essentially, uh, where are we? If we? Take the crop, move this over here like that, then you've missed, you move, lose that whole chunk of um, water coming down to the right and really what makes this photo is this zigzag you, you've got the the river the, coming down from the top left over to the mid middle of the right and then back down to the bottom left and it's that triangle that movement of water which is really what's this about so you have the same problem which is if you crop down from above like that then you kind of lose a bit of that as well now this is one of those things Janet where a little bit depends on what editing software you're using or if you're not using any editing software, kind of why not? Um, going beyond just cropping, which you can do with pretty much anything, um, there is, with nearly all photography, some kind of editing is required. Now, there are debates, even arguments, among some people who say that photography is what happens in the, in the camera, and the point you go click, that's where photography ends and anything you do after that is messing about with it and isn't real photography. So in-camera photographers tends to be the term that people will use for these. Uh, it's wildly inaccurate as far as I see it because the camera, especially these days, is interpreting what it sees. So there's a whole bunch of algorithms which decide where it's going to go. So whether the, you know, so there's a bit of a mix there. But even beyond that, the real thing here is what I tend to feel is what we are doing is we are creating images and we are creating narratives. We are creating uh, moods, little stories, feelings that we are trying to convey to somebody else. And as such, your, your photo is almost like a first draft. I don't tend to feel the superiority with the first click on the camera. To me, that feels a bit, if those who would argue that, the that's a bit like saying your first draft of a poem is the most authentic one. Anything after that is just messing about. It isn't. Your first draft is your first draft. And then you edit it and you polish it up in order to get across the message that you want to get across. It's, this isn't about literal documentation and say this is exactly what... Now, if you're fine, if you're doing forensic photography... <laughs> <laughs> then, you know, photographing the crime scene is absolutely vital that you don't go removing bits or shifting bits or darkening down um, areas that might become of um, important evidence later. But we're not talking about that. We're not talking about forensic um, photo of this. At its very least, for example, what you've done here is you've got this at one eighth of a second. And at an eighth of a second, uh, sorry, 0 0.8 of a second, so let, almost a whole second, um, and exposure. And what that does is that's created this sort of slightly creamy effect on the water. That isn't how we see water. We Our eyes uh, operate at a faster rate than that. So you have manipulated the camera already to change how the picture would look. So we're already in a process of doing that. So as such, I see absolutely no problem whatsoever in editing out the stray leaf that you felt was um, grabbing the attention. Now, depending on the software that you've got, in here, on, in Photoshop, I've got a little thing called a spot healing tool. And if I click on that, I can change the size of it. And if I do a big thing, you see, I can do that. And it does funny things. What it does is it takes um, what's around the area and it sort of fills in what it might do. Now you do something like that, suddenly the water stops flowing. But if we zoom in here and I just make this a little bit smaller and I just do that, miraculously it vanishes. Alternatively, there is the clone tool. 
And what the clone tool does is the clone tool takes one bit of the picture. So say I copy that bit there and then I can paste it over here. So wherever I copy that, it starts filling in similarly. Um, so likewise, if I was over here, what I might do is I might think, well, what's the background of that like? I'll take clone that bit and just, that's what I need to put that at 100% clone that little bit there, take a little bit from there, just keep that in and then take a little bit from here. And we're just trying to create a sympathetic clone so that we can get rid of little bits without it being overly noticeable. And there it's vanished. So whether you're using a clone tool or you're using a healing tool or one, one of the other tools which you can use is um, the patch tool in this case, which is up same with it, where what you do is you select this bit of area here and then we drag it and we find something else to fill it in. Obviously, we don't want to fill in with a bit of water, a little bit of moss. The bright moss, moss might look a bit odd, but maybe if we take something like this and we try, try and line it up so that you've got that um, the diagonal just sort of lining up something like that. And there we go. That's essentially done the same kind of a bit like the it's a sort of mix between the healing tool and the, the clone tool. So either way, you've managed to get rid of it. And so in essence, that's what you need to do. Sometimes when we are out, you are in a particular place, you cannot, as you say, if you're on a boardwalk, there's a limit to how high or low or left or right or however you can go in order to capture the scene that you want. So capture the scene as best you can and then with the idea that you can edit it, how you might edit it afterwards. Once you've now got the picture like this, it's then up to you as you want to, whether you want to change it to black and white. Now you've changed it to black and white as before, and in fact, actually in your black and white version, I would say the potential problematic here is that you've blown out some of the white, some of the texture has gone here. Um, you've lightened it quite a lot, and I think you've kind of lost some of the, the bit here. So if I was putting this into, I'll put this into camera raw, um, even if I was putting it in black and white, so let's in fact, actually let's just click black and white there. What I might want to do is pull the highlights. If I pull those highlights down a bit, you see we actually get more in the way of texture going on up here. And then perhaps what I want to do is maybe I bring the exposure up a little bit, but not too much. A little bit of control, maybe clarity. Yeah, something like clarity I think works quite well. A little bit of texture perhaps. A little bit of contrast, maybe a little bit up out of the shadows. And so we end up with something, maybe a little bit more like that. And then this way, you've got it in black and white, if you want it in black and white, uh, but you still retain some of the texture that's in the water because part of what works so well with this photo is the fact that you've got this, uh, the long exposure, stream, creamy streaming of the water and in your version um, of this you've lost some of that in your editing so I think really what it comes down to with this Janet is your problems were solvable but if you but it's, a, it's an editing process it's about understanding um, how, how how to work your your editing program and really the thing is with that is play OK, is play with it. See what you can do. Grab a grab an image. Do six different edits of it. OK, um, take a take a photo, do a black and white version, do a color shifted version, do um, a high contrast version, do a low contrast version, crop it in different ways. And that's really how we learn. I mean, humans, we know you, <laughs> you watch children, children learn through play. You actually watch any nature program, animals learn through play. We as adults still learn through play. Play with the image, explore what your editing software can do with it. Uh, hopefully then that gives you a few answers. Thanks for sending that one in. OK, what I've uh, got a few more comments in here. Uh, where are we? Um, April says, um, oh, no, Anne, I wish for a fast recovery. Oh, Robert says, thanks, Kim. Just a foot bone, but it is the second in eight months. Yeah, well, that's that's Oh, yeah, I mean, it's not it's just a foot bone. A, a bone is a bone. And if you're struggling with walking, then that's really awful. So, yeah, our thoughts, our thoughts with, are with Anne 
Um, okay, Meg also says get well soon, Anne. Um, and April says she needs to be much more careful uh, photographing Robert. <laughs> uh, did it happen when you tripped over? Um, Sandra says... Oh, no. Uh, well, aren't we? Sorry, Sandra says, gosh, two breaks in a year, that's bad luck, hope you get better soon. So Janet says she's using Elements, I'm assuming that's Photoshop Elements. So Photoshop Elements, and now I don't have, I've got the full version of Photoshop, but I'm fairly certain Photoshop Elements actually has these summer versions of these cloning tools or patch tools, certainly worth playing around with and exploring. And if you're not sure, then use YouTube, type in Photoshop Elements into YouTube and put in cloning tool or something like that, and there will be thousands of YouTube videos on how to use um, Photoshop Elements. Sandra says, lovely photo, I use Elements and I use the clone tool to remove unwanted items. Uh, or oh, Janet says, I'm not very good with the clone and healing tools, couldn't make it look believable. Again, I, it's practice, it's practice, practice, practice. You just, it's largely about lining up, making sure that each bit matches the other bit so you don't end up with something just a little bit odd so, you know, you don't end up with a blob of water where the cliff should be. Or if there's a, a line running down diagonally down the, the, through the rocks, then you find another bit of a line running on a similar diagonal. Um, but like I say, the more you play with it, the better you get at it. Um, April says, question, what tool should be used to get rid of a smudgy or glare spot on a building that is caused naturally? To be honest, until I see the photo, I don't know, April. But certainly, if you want to send that one in for next week, please do. Um, yes, and this, this applies all the way through to all of you. If you, you know, if there is something, if you are, if you found a sticking point, you've got a bit of a picture, and you don't know how to sort something out, then send it in, and I will do my best to either show you the best tool to use or the best approach to it, or explain what you might have done differently when you were doing the photo uh, in order to get round the problem. Right, and John says, I like the shot and understand the challenge of getting the shot without the distractions, I uh, like Kim's solution. Okay, excellent, so thank you very much for that. So let's move on then. So next what I'm going to do is I'm going to move to Sandra. Now, Sandra sent in, where are we? Um, she's done two different crops and so, Sandra, let's actually just zoom in a little bit and fill, fill that space a bit more. So, Sandra says, uh, Hi Kim, I've been doing knitting, a, a knitting still life, but I'm not sure if I have uh, put too many things into the photo and overcomplicated it. Also, I'm not sure on the best crop either. I think there's potential for a good still life with the props and goods and source material. I have, but I don't think I've quite got there. Some feedback would be really helpful and I can have another go at this as long as, um, as, long as I have a few hours to spare. I attached the original photo and a couple of different crops. So this was one crop. Um, this was another crop, a closer in crop, and this is the original. So what Sandra's done then is she's a uh, fan of knitting, set up a knitting still, still like God. In fact, we've even got Sandra's knitting bag here. Got a little mouse doing knitting. Knitting needles. Um, not that. Um, all right, that's what I was trying to do. We've got knitting pattern, knit and purl. Uh, so there's lots, lots of kind of all knitting -y stuff to go together. So it's a good start for a still life. But she's not totally happy with the, the crop. So this was one version of the crop which emphasizes, the, brings it a little bit more, and this one comes in even closer. So this one's making more of the mouse. Um, what do you do with something like this? And so part of your question was, uh, is it essentially, is it too complicated? What's the, what's the best kind of crop with this? Now, still life is one of these, I think rather wonderful genres where you get to control you get to control all the elements and so it's brilliant to learn on the original still lifes that you think tend to think of with dutch old masters doing their the vases of flowers and peeled fruit and stuff like that a lot of these were practice pieces they were ways of exploring and experimenting so they could learn how the light falls and how it reflects and how the colours interact with other colours that are on that are in front of them, how shiny or matte objects reflect light differently. 
and they could move them around and play with the composition. And so unlike if you're doing street photography where you've got or wildlife photography, where you've got things that are potentially moving, you've got to be really quick, you don't have time to set them up, you can't stop and arrange people. Um, still life is one of these things where you really get the chance to you control everything. You can control the light, you can control the objects, you can control how the objects are arranged. And as such, it's a major opportunity to really explore all these different techniques that we've talked about over the years. So when you come to something like knitting, how many objects can you have? Well, you, could, you can do a still life with a single ball of wool and a couple of knitting needles if you want. Or in this case, what you've done is you've created a, an entire set. So what are the compositional tools that you're wanting here? Well, part of this is deciding which part of the narrative is, is there a most important part or is there, or is it about trying to take in the whole and creating a flow around it? So what I'll do, let me bring out, I've used, used this one before, but it's always, it's always a, um, it's a good, it's a good excuse, uh, it's a good example of a, of a still life and how a still life can work. So this one here, what we've got is, and now some of you may remember, did this one during lockdown on a thing on still life, where what we decided to do was, I decided to uh, emulate a kind of old master's style painting with still life, with the fruit and the pots and the, and the candle with the, the snuffed out candle. And the thing is with this, this is, if you like, quite a complex image. There's lots of different things going on. We've got uh, black grapes and green grapes, we've got apples, we've got lemon, uh, oranges, we've got a pomegranate that's open, we've got pears, we've got wooden platter, we've got different textures, we've got knife, jug, two different kinds of jugs, two different kinds of surfaces. And yet it doesn't necessarily feel too crowded. It works in the way that it flows. And a big part of the composition of this was all about the flow. And so actually I will open this with Photoshop. Um, because what I want to do is just talk about the notion of the flow of the lines. So if I just create a new line there, let's just make that white and let's get a pencil tool. Because what we have here is there's a sense of movement through. So if you like, you see the, the, the peel that comes down here, we've got a kind of edge here, which we've got a, the pear brings our eye over this way. We've got the orange peel drops us round here. We've got the curve of the jug and the jug's pointing um, in this direction and the knife is pointing in this direction. So that brings our eye back up round here. We've got the jug pointing in this direction, which brings us back round here. So we've got a flow like that. Or if we come from the other direction and we come up, we've also got the way these, these grapes drop down. So this sort of drops down and again, catches up with the eye peel and sort of brings our eye in and out. So we've got constantly what's happening with this picture is it's contained. There's a there's a notion of as you get towards the edge of the photo, this um, on this side, you've got the, the pear pointing this way and you've got the orange peel, the, the lemon peel, which bring your eye back into the photo. As you get over to this side, you've got the knife, you've got the curve of the plate, you've got the jug pointing that way and it brings you back into the photo. So there's a constant kind of flow that keeps bringing you back into the photo and that's the way the composition is being used. And then things like the, the angle of the pear, the tumbling grapes, what have you, are giving you levels of diagonal and a sense of movement and stuff happening. So even though it's a still, still life, there isn't actually anything moving. There's a sense of movement, a sense of the grapes tumbling down the side. So with that in mind, when we come back to your picture, how is the flow of it? And part of the problem that you have here is the lack of flow. There isn't really an obvious place for where the eye is supposed to be going. So your key things in this the key things for, for your still life are things like your leading lines, containment, uh, and where, you, well, really it's about leading lines. Uh, bits of diagonals as well. Diagonals can help create the movement. Now, what we have here, when we sort of look at your picture, the two strongest, actually let's just create a little line here. The, the, the most powerful, you've got a very strong horizontal line here which is either pointing us over that direction or 
is pointing us out of the picture. And if you like, the cardinal sin of still life picture is to be thrown out of the picture. We're trying to be contained within it. Um, these two to get, although you've got the two together, which do narrow in a bit, this one kind of goes here, but then this one goes here as well. So they kind of end up taking us round to that corner. So again, it isn't really helping. Another strong set of lines we've got is this, but that's taking us down here, which isn't overly doing anything. And another one is this, which is either taking us that way or is taking us that way. Again, neither of which are actually taking us towards anything. Now, the one place where you do have a bit of a leading line going, which I would say is really kind of working a bit more carefully with for you, well for you, is the way your bit of scarf knitting up here curves around and then points towards your mouse. And that works quite well, I think, of all the sort of parts of your, um, of your picture. It's essentially this bit which works best. And because you have that line of the scarf coming up, or the knitting rather, and it points towards the mouse. So that is giving you essentially the best bit of story. Now, if you were to say, okay, well, what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna build my still life around that, then maybe by changing the angle of your knitting needles here, so that rather than pointing in that direction, you actually put them across so they pointed in that direction, then you would have leading lines also pointing to the mouse. Okay, and maybe you could do something else even, and if these ones were upright, you would also have them pointing to the mouse. And so by subtle combinations of knitting needles and knitting itself, and then maybe you've, you angle the book edge. You, there's, there's a bit of a line down here, which is at the moment taking us over in that direction. But if you change the angle of the book so that that was pointing in that direction, these little subtle uses of leading lines would all bring your eye towards the mouse with the knitting. So that's one way of playing around with it. Um, and so really this is kind of what you, you decide on where your, your picture is going. Because certainly if you're wanting to contain you need something to bring your eye back if it starts wandering over here. And at the moment it doesn't because the lines lead you out, out of the way. Or you want something that brings you back in here. And it doesn't really much. It's sort of, fear, okay, there is a bit of an edge line here with, with the cardigan. But it's not really a strong line which, which curves you back in. So ultimately, Sandra, I think herein lies your problem. Is, you know, doesn't matter whether, you know, with this one here, you're trying to make sure that you've got Sandra's knitting is still staying in. And that's fine. And we've got a little bit more about the mouse. And ultimately, I think the mouse is working quite well. But we're still lacking. At this point, we've now lost the leading line of the, the, the knitting here. Um, it still feels like you could do more with playing around with angles and lines to draw your attention, but also darkening down corners. I mean, this is where the kind of vignette comes in, where you just darken down the edges and then it helps to kind of create that subtle little boundary and then you lighten up or create more contrast. Because the other thing is with this, because it's a very, very textured background, we can see the mouse, but we have to look a little bit harder at it. If I just duplicate this for a moment and supposing then, in fact, what I was to do was to lighten the mouse up. So actually, I'll tell you what, let's take the curves and do a little bit more contrast, but uh, where are we? Where's the, um, sorry, I need to turn that to black. Take that out and then I will just paint back in uh, that contrast. Where are we? Ah, right, okay, Let's change my settings up here. That's left over from something else. Um, maybe do something like that. Or maybe the other way where what we do is we take the curves and we darken down everything else. And again, leave the mouse a little bit brighter, something like that. So you can use the idea of um, light and dark to draw your attention to something as well. So ultimately, we have a whole bunch of tools at our disposal in order to bring our attention towards a particular uh, subject within a scene. And if you decided that the mouse, for example, was ultimately the most important part, then 
your tool, tools at your disposal are things like, well, first of all, it's focus. If, you, if your mouse is in focus, but the rest of the is a bit out of focus, then that's one way of doing it. However, for this, you're wanting to keep all the wonderful texture of the knitting. The texture of the knitting potentially interferes with it, so you need other things. You can use light, like I was doing light and dark there, but you've got to be careful about keeping it looking natural. So ultimately, then, your next tool at your disposal is this notion of leading lines. What other subtle lines seem to be pointing your eye in the direction of where you want the viewer to go? And that's where your still life then comes into its own because you can arrange those knitting needles, you can arrange the edge of the book, you can arrange the knitting, you can arrange the cardigan, you can arrange the sleeve of the cardigan so that it, um, where are we? Yeah, so something like this. At the moment, your sleeve kind of comes down here and this, but supposing it was just kind of lightly curving round and again, just sort of pointing as though there's an arm coming across and gesturing towards the mouse. So you, I hopefully then you can see what I mean with all that, Sandra, that the, you can go for a busy scene, but you then have to control that busy scene. You have to control the viewer's eye. The, the viewer, when hit with all these different things going on, will go, where am I supposed to look? And if you don't help them where they should look, guide them to where they should look, then the photo feels ultimately unsatisfactory. They won't spend very long with it and they'll disappear. However, if you've guided them through this use of light and dark, leading lines, uh, sometimes focus, these kind of compositional tricks and tools, then the photo feels much more satisfying. So I hope that helps. I hope that makes sense uh, to you there, Sandra. Okay, um, where are we? Uh, okay, a couple of comments. Um, oh, April says it's so cute, um, and I always I'll also enjoy the fruit still life. Meg says, are you going to be doing another still life, but with vegetables? <laughs> April says, great idea, Meg. Maybe at some point then, Meg. Maybe we can play around with that at some point. Right, okay, so let's move on then. Uh, next up then, I'm going to go to John Smith. So, John sent in, um, where are we? Um, John sent this photo and he said, I don't often uh, send a photo, oh no, sorry, that's wrong John. We've got two Johns, we've got John Smith and John Harvey, but we're going for John Smith's first. And he just said, oh, I asked him what kind of feedback he was after and the feedback I'm after is how could I improve it? Now, there's a, what I would say is there, there's a, there's a kind of slight problem with that and in that how can I improve it is a very vague <laughs> thing because the problem is is that there's always a hundred different ways to improve a photo depending on what your aim is and I've, I've thought long and hard about this one I've been thinking a lot about this one John because there's a certain theme and I'm realizing it's, it's occurring with so a few weeks ago you sent in a photo of um, your granddaughter's friend that you've taken on a white fleece background, a white sheet background. And then a couple of weeks ago, or la last week, I can't remember exactly, you sent in a picture of a street scene. It was kind of cinematic-ish. Um, but there wasn't necessarily something to latch on to. And, with, and then with this photo as well, I tend to feel one of the problems you're up against is not fully knowing what it is you're trying to take. Um, I, let, let's go into this and explain a little bit more, okay? Well, actually, be, tell you what, before I get into that bit, there is one little thing that I have to say. Now, Susan will probably be smiling at this because she'll know exactly what I'm gonna say, which is why on earth are you creating a frame around it, a mounted bit? You are losing space by that. Now, this idea of creating, now, if you are gonna print this picture up, Maybe you want to have a printed mount around it because that's that that's fine. But on a screen, and what you've got to remember is different people have got different size screens. Now I'm fine. I've got a nice 24 inch screen to look at. Some people have even bigger screens. But most people are operating with a 10 inch screen or less for a tablet or a six inch screen for a phone. And when you take this image and you put it down to phone size, now, 
you've you, essentially there's a whole you've there's a lot of real estate that's not being used properly um that you've you've lost a whole bunch of pixels you've got all these extra pixels here this picture could be bigger and filling the space and instead you've made the small photo even smaller and digitally when it's being looked at on a screen there is no point in that you're wanting to try and get the maximum use of pixels out of any space that you've got and so in a case like this you just it you know have it cropped to the picture itself you know don't don't be sticking um funny extra little sorry i'm setting uh, it isn't this is leaping itself to the edges so we do that so that's really what the picture actually is and then you can make the picture bigger <laughs> and it fills the screen better so first of all um, and it is kind of one of my pet peeves is when you're doing something for the screen, when you're doing something for online, that's only going to be seen on a screen, then don't waste space by sticking a, a mount or frame on it because you're reducing the amount of pixels you have available to you to get your picture across. Why make it smaller than it needs to be? OK, so that aside, the next thing is what we're into is here with this photo and we're back to this problem of the fact that you've just said how can i improve it and i don't really know what kind of improvement you're after because there's different ways you can go about it so for example if we take a look at this what you've got a, is here you've got a picture of a woman holding a cigarette holder with a cigarette in it and she's looking at the camera what's your story what's this about why have you taken this photo? What are you hoping to induce in the viewer when you see it? So if we to, to come, so this is about story again. OK, so if we come back to the notion of she's got a cigarette holder, why has she got a cigarette holder? If she's got a now, the cigarette holders were extraordinarily popular and I um, between sort of from the 1920s to the 1950s or maybe 1960s. But essentially in the 1950s what happened was filter cigarettes came out uh, the great thing about a cigarette holder was back in the days before filters you had problems with the paper would stick to your lips you'd end up with bits of tobacco in your mouth also um you know so whereas having a cigarette holder kind of got ra got around that problem then women also found the problem with a small cigarette you could get um ash dropping onto your uh, your dress so a longer cigarette holder allowed you to, to smoke without the ash necessarily falling on top of you so there were kind of practical things and then this became a stylized thing and people would invest lots of money and create jeweled and fancy gold rimmed things and all the rest of it when filter cigarettes came along which essentially got rid of the problem of the cigarette sticking to your mouth or tobacco going in your mouth when you smoked they started to fall out of fashion what this means, though, is that when we look at a cigarette holder, apart from one or two people who would sort of play with them for affectation, um, it tends to be a very vintage, retro kind of look. So we tend to, when we see somebody with a cigarette holder, we are expecting them to look like something from an Agatha Christie novel, or we're expecting them to look so something from the 1920s through to maybe the 1960s, you know, um, so we're either looking at the kind of the flappers of the 1920s or you can go through to, um, ah, suddenly forgotten her name, really famous actress. Anyway, OK, it doesn't matter. Somebody else will know. In which case you would be expecting this woman here to then have a hairstyle and or a costume to match. She doesn't. OK, so she's wearing a much more modern top. Uh, she's got modern style makeup and she's got um, a little eyebrow piercing. So the eyebrow piercing, the style of makeup and the top she's wearing puts her very contemporary. This is a very much a now kind of photo. Could be taken in the last five years. But, you know, we're talking about we're into the 21st century with this look. The cigarette holder then is out of place. Now, she could be, maybe this is an attitude thing. Maybe this is a striking out there and saying, hey, I'm creating a whole kind of look and attitude. Except for the fact that nothing else seems to match that either. I was thinking about the photo that um, Andy put in the um, 
to uh, last week's cinematic um, uh, challenge. This Now, here you've got a woman with a cigarette. Now, if she had a cigarette holder, that wouldn't look necessarily out of place because what really makes this photo is the attitude. There's a, a, there's a confrontational sense with this photo. She's not caring what you think or she's going to challenge what you think. And then actually having something as distinct as a cigarette holder says even more about it. It's like, go on then, challenge me, say something, you know. She's very much being her own person with that. And it's a very different style of photo. This one, however, isn't quite in the same realm. So there's, in essence, where I, I tend to feel when I look at this, what I see is instead of seeing a story, you know, unlike that one with Andy, where you are hit with a picture of a woman giving you attitude straight into the face, and you're reacting to the story first and then thinking about it as a photo second, this one, I'm seeing the photo. This one, what I see is somebody in a photographic studio holding a cigarette holder. And a bit like when I said before with uh, the picture of your granddaughter's friend, all I could see was a picture of a young girl squatting down in a photographic studio, but I couldn't really fully make sense of it. I'm seeing it as a setup. I'm not seeing it as a story. I don't know what the story is with this. I mean, compositionally, um, this cigarette holder is going straight out. If you were going to have it, you would maybe have it at a diagonal. But it's still really, when I look at this, you see, when I look at this photo, what this photo is really about is the way the woman is looking at the camera. And in fact, I, when I look at the, the cigarette holder, it's a distraction because all I'm thinking is, why has she got a cigarette holder? Because it doesn't match up with the rest of her. It doesn't feel like it flows. It doesn't feel like it's part of an attitude. It doesn't feel like it's part of a retro fashion statement. Uh, it doesn't feel like it's being part of a reenactment. It just kind of feels out of the way. And actually, if I, at this point, let's just, in fact, well, let's take the remove. I've got a, um, let's use the, the remove tool. And let's remove the cigarette holder. And now she's got a hand there and that looks wrong. So let's just remove the hand and then see what happens here. Now, I've lost a bit of a shoulder. I might need a bit more shoulder over here, but I think actually once you remove, and then of course we've got a little bit of smoke up there, which is fairly unneeded. And at this point then, maybe you come in for more of a portrait. And if you've got that, then what we have is not a bad portrait of a young woman, okay? Now, and then at this point, I would say um, the light wise, if we go to our levels, doesn't, yeah, there's a big gap over on the right here with the histogram. You probably want to brighten it up a little bit. Having brightened it up, we become aware that the chest part is even brighter. So what I might do then is um, just, uh, wrong one, uh, where are we? No, that, yeah, just slightly darken down the chest area a little bit so that the attention gets drawn to the face rather than the bright area where it was. And I think at that point, you know, you've got a, um, you've got a picture which kind of worked. That feels like a portrait. Um, or for that matter, if we, we go back to the crop, if you wanted to do a more cinematic portrait, you could kind of come down there and pull that across here and pull that up there and swap that round and you can do something like that and um, where are we uh, let's go back to the patch tool and just put that kind of color in there and then we have a slightly more cinematic style portrait so whether you want to go square or you want to go porch but the whole point with this is that really this photo what it says to me from the beginning is it's the way she's looking at the camera and the way she's engaging with the camera has much more of that slightly more formal, you know, completely formal, but slightly more formal portrait look to it. The idea of the cigarette holder is play, but then it's play with what? Because she doesn't have a vintage hairstyle or dress on or anything like that, nor is she 
kind of like got a hyper modern but retro interesting weird fashion sense where she's decided to pull out the um the cigarette holder to go with it so in essence it's, it's there's a conceptual problem i think is is at the heart of this one john and to go back to what i was starting to come in on because i kind of got ahead of myself there which is about what's the purpose of your photo and if you don't understand what the purpose of your photo is then it makes all your next decisions much more difficult you see what tends to happen for most of us is where we end up we take it we we know there's something we're sort of interested in so we take a whole bunch of photos and then try and figure out the reason for it afterwards and this is why i keep one of my kind of constant refrains of late and certainly over the last year has been that every time you bring the camera up to your eye there's a reason you brought the camera up and you've got to understand the more easily you can understand the reason you're going to take that photo the easier it is to make all the next decisions to come along what's your purpose what are you trying to convey to the viewer are you trying to convey to the viewer quirky weird um, sexy intellectual authority attitude fear horror love excitement um, curiosity all the you know all these and a thousand more what's important what are you trying to do are you trying to draw people's attention to and the great thing about the camera is we can sit and point the camera at anything and then go click and then we can look at it and go oh that's kind of interesting and then we do something interesting with it but sometimes you take a picture and it's not that necessarily so interesting because we haven't really worked out what it's supposed to be saying the photos that grab us the most are the ones which feel that they convey something they convey some kind of mood or story or narrative and it doesn't have to be war and peace it doesn't have to be a great long novel but it can just be like a hint of an attitude um, and that's what grabs us but when you have something where you've got two different narratives going on so we've got her looking at the camera but then she's got this cigarette holder which just feels out of place and then we've got this funny frame around it which is why I, I still don't really understand the point of having a frame around something because like I say it just makes it means you've got less space to show off your photo then I think you've got you end up with a massive confusion and so ultimately then john i hope this i hope this makes sense for you is that it's about deciding what's the important point of this photo if the important point is hey we're doing the dressing up box then go for the full dressing up box you know do a 1920s outfit with a fancy hairstyle or a 1960s outfit with a fancy hairstyle um if it's about this woman and how she's engaging with the camera then allow it to be the picture of her engaging with the camera. Allow her to look into it and just crop off anything else which is distracting and just have the headshot. So I hope that makes sense. Um, that ultimately your picture, and, and this comes back to the, the key thing, which is when you say, when I said to you, what do you want me to tell you about the picture? And you said, well, I don't know just how to improve it. That very statement shows that you don't know really what it was you were trying to get out of the photo um, and without knowing that without really having a sense of what your narrative is it, it makes it so much harder to intensify as I said earlier uh, about the notion uh, to, to Janet about that notion of with photography we have an idea and then we're using our editing tools to enhance that idea same thing with Sandra once we under, if we understand that what it's about, say, is the little mouse, then we intensify. We use all the different compositional tricks in order to intensify that narrative, to distill it, to remove all the elements that are distracting, to up the game of all the things that are enhancing the photo. But you can only do that once you've understood what the photo is about. So that's really, in a way, if you like, that's your homework. That's the thing that I think you need to learn. And it's not just you, John. This is an extraordinarily common thing, an extraordinarily common thing. Um, not a lot of people really truly understand what their photos are trying to convey. And ultimately, I would say that that is probably the biggest thing that I do on this podcast is about trying to move people towards the direction of getting a better understanding. So understanding photography with Kim Ayers is as much about understanding why you're taking the photo and what you're hoping to achieve with that photo, what you're hoping to get 
response you're hoping to get out of the viewer when they look at that photo and then making all the adjustments all the compositional light and editing and everything else all the adjustments in order to enhance and intensify what you're trying to get across so anyway i hope that makes sense and i hope that gives you food for thought for how you approach your photography in future but thank you for sending that in right okay Uh, Pat says she likes to go with a cigarette. Um, April says, much better without the frame already. Sandra says that's helpful. Um, oh, I did want to draw attention to the mouse and now I have the ideas of how to do that. I can change uh, to darker jumpers in the background to create a darker, lighter contrast. Well, that's great. Yes, that's really good, Sandra. It's to, to have that idea of, um, yeah, you once you know what it is you're, if you're aiming towards getting the mouse, then yes, you use the other elements, the light and dark, the leading lines, all these kind of things to help draw attention to it. Uh, Mr. Mackey XD has joined us and said, good day everyone, wherever you may be, looks like a glamorous photo. Uh, Susan says, Marlena Dietrich, well, of course, yeah, that's the classic one with the, the cigarette. Uh, April says, and the hairdo is, is older looking. Um, Pat says, wonderful expression, second fun, second photo, April says, nice portrait. Okay, right. So what we're going to do now then is we're going to move on to John Harvey. So, uh, yeah, so John says, I don't often send a photo in and I should. The photo I'm submitting is from a recent trip to an Amish. Amish? 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 Is it long? Ah, ah, Amish or Amish? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> event called Horse Progress Days. It is essentially an agricultural fair for the Amish. I'll go with Amish until somebody corrects me. I'm just getting round to editing them and after your last presentation I set a couple of them up as cinema type photos. My query does this photo work? Um, and so if we show um, what we've got here is uh, John's picture. And now, John has said, does it work? But then he goes on to say, I am wondering about the distance between the two boys. And so that becomes a little bit more interesting. This is, uh, this is giving me something to latch on to. So we've got a slight, we've got a more cinematic crop here, uh, which is so, and this was tying in, this, this idea came out of when we were talking about the whole idea of creating something cinematic. Now, what becomes, now there is a big distance between these boys here. Uh, so what becomes a bit more interesting is John did send me the original where and at this point what I find interesting is when is about how I've talked before about how the notion of gaps become exaggerated in photography because when we look at it here there yes there's a gap between the boys but the gap between the boys doesn't feel quite so big because in the in terms of the whole photo the gap between these boys is from 1400 to 3200, so that's uh, 1800 pixels, as opposed to 0 to 1400 and 32 to 44, so, so I'm just trying to read these, so 12, so 26. So basically there's more space either side of the boys than there is between them. Okay, But when we switched to the, edi uh, the edited version, there's more space between them than there is either side of them. Essentially, because there's a, because of the way it's cropped, the bigger space between them makes that space pr proportionally to the whole photo. So our viewpoint means that there looks like there's a much, much bigger gap between them there than it does here. Now, the other problem with this, with this is there's a lot more space around in total. So the question is then, is what can you do with a photo like this? And this is where I think the cinematic crop, if we're playing with cinematic crop, let's, I'll tell you what, let's do that. If I create a new one and what we will do is we will go for the um, 1000 high by the, let's do the extreme one. Then we'll do the 2391. So this is full wide angle. Um, right, sorry, where are uh-huh, hold on a sec, let me do that. Right, okay, I hope I've been showing you the picture meanwhile that I've been talking about. Not sure what what I've been pressing on. Um, you know what, let me just, no, right. Okay, Robert says Amish, right, okay, good. <laughs> uh, not Robert, John, sorry. Okay, so what I've done is I've created, so let me copy that. 
select all, copy. That's what I'm trying to do. We'll go to your original photo and I'll paste that on there. And now I, what I can do is proportionally keep it. Um, in fact, what we'll do now is change the opacity. So now what I can do is if I take this out to here, then what we can see is if I can move this up or down or wherever else, this gives us a sense of what it might look like. Now, your one is kind of cropped more like this, where you've got a little bit of gap to the right and a sort of more gap to the left. You've got it slightly higher going up there um, and that creates a bigger gap. But if you go kind of full cinematic the length here, then actually what happens is we keep these boys sort of feel don't feel quite so far apart. Now, there's a lot of white space as well here, so maybe we don't need, but there's interesting stuff going up in the background. Um, actually, maybe if I pull that down a little bit, something like that, and we kind of create, we'll allow for the middle of this to run through here, I think. And whereas quite often you're playing with normal, with ordinary photography, rule of thirds is very often the dominant uh, composition. I think when you go cinematic you can tend to play around with symmetry a little bit more. Now if I take that off we start to end up with something a little bit more going on. Now if we're wanting to create the relationship between the boys part of the problem we've got here as well is with the busy background we've got the two boys here that are not necessarily standing out as much. This one is in his space, this one is sort of moving and getting slightly confused with the, the people in the background. So what you might want to do in this case is they're both wearing these sort of slightly indigo purple shirts. So let's first of all let's just take this into uh, camera raw and just if I auto that and maybe bring the shadows up a little bit and then a little bit of clarity something like that um, that's giving us a brighter picture what I think I might also want to do again to draw our attention to the boys here is give it a little bit of a vignette so I'll just very slightly touch the edges the corners so that our eyes get drawn back into here but then what I might want to do is I'm going to use the dodge and burn tool I'm going to use the dodge tool here I've got that set onto the midtones and I'm just going to lighten up this purple shirt a little bit just so that it kind of stands out a little bit more grabs a little bit more attention um, so we've gone from that to that and then that in turn helps to kind of just add into the relationship between the two boys because they're dressed in the same way not just the same hats and trousers but they both got these purple shirts then what you're doing is you're adding just adding little clues as to what the connection is between these two people here and I think something like that then starts to feel a bit more cinematic that starts to feel like something is happening within a space I mean there's several different stories here um, I mean if we were to I mean there's there's if I was to hold let's see move you know there's a there's a whole interesting kind of story going on over here where we've got um, got a little kind of a Nespresso no, espresso, um, caravan where you can go and get your coffee or Italian soda and sort of kind of people sort of in costume in their outfits and what have you um, there and at that point if you've got something like that I mean that becomes a sort of slightly interesting one as well um, maybe you you draw enough of the boy up there we just keep the espresso in have that cutting through his legs and um, then we're not worrying about the other boy but part of the background then he's on his own and that background sort of changes alternatively over here there's a different kind of story going on where we've got more people in the sort of mid ground and maybe at this point you could just go for this boy on his own um, but maybe you want a bit of that sky because also further up there's quite a lot happening up on the horizon as well um, with this sort of obviously something's going on over the top there and maybe if you've got something like this where this boy just sort of crops into the corner something you've got another kind of story going on there so I think the the fun part to just go back to the that whole notion of the cinematic crop um, 
is that you can take your, your, your shape and then you can move it around and decide whereabouts in the photo it might be of more interest. Um, obviously not there. So ultimately though, I think to come back to that notion of the space between the boys, if you want less, apparently less space between the boys, without actually literally cropping one out and placing it elsewhere, is you need more space out with the boys. You need more space on the outside of the boys in order for the boys in the middle to feel slightly closer together. Because let's face it, if we crop them so that this person's right on the edge and this person's right on the edge, and you do something like that, then the gap between them appears absolutely massive uh, because it's taking up 90% of the photo. Whereas when we are uh, here, that's only taking up 40 to 50 percent of the photo. And in your original one, it was taking up probably 60 to 70 percent. So hopefully that makes sense to you there, John. Um, you do have a problem with that in the fact that there's an awful lot of space where nothing is really happening. And if you're wanting the boys to be part of it, you then end up having to include a lot of this space that isn't where nothing's really happening. So other stories might be where you just include one of the boys, but try and get more into the background, as we as we were sort of saying there. So I hope that all makes sense to you um, there, John. All right. OK, we have a few more uh, comments here. Um, where are we? Uh, oh, uh, April wants to know if that was in Pennsylvania, um, and John says that was actually in India, Indiana. Um, so a little bit of conversation going on between them. Um, and, okay, so what is it? Pat says the Idis, Idis seem to favor turquoise. Uh, April says, I'm thinking has to do with certain groups, especially if there's competition or whatever event is taking place. Um, okay, so there's a conversation going on about that. So. OK, that's pretty much about brought us to an end here. So next week, then we will be talking uh, well, there'll be another opportunity for feedback. So make sure you send me your photos, uh, put them in the uh, Facebook group, Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers, or email them to me, kim at kimayers.co.uk. Also, if you happen to find these uh, podcasts useful, interesting or entertaining, then do consider supporting them buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayers is one of the ways you can do it. Don't forget to like, subscribe and invite your friends along as well. Uh, so, yes, if you have questions, if you have photos, uh, send them to me. This podcast here and especially next week's podcast, I'm not doing talking about any other aspects. It will be purely on feedback, uh, feedback or on the questions or the photos that you send me. So if you don't send me anything, we have a very short podcast. Um, Okay, with all that in mind, where do I go? I need to press that, I need to press that. Um, thank you ever so much to uh, to John, to Janet, to other John and to Sandra for sending in the images. I hope you found it useful. And thank you to everybody who joined in and commented and uh, has uh, kept the conversation going too. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Cheerio. <laughs>